So welcome back to another uh, session or an episode in our Conscious Parenting sister, uh, series with the Conscious Parenting founder and uh, coach, Esther Montmane. And today, I'd like to start, Esther, uh, first of all, welcoming you, but also to start by asking you to talk a little bit about basic needs. What are basic needs and what what this is kind of a foundational area, I think, of conscious parenting. So do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, basic needs for me is like the part of our role as adults that we take care of the well-being of the child. And it is related to everything that has to do with uh, emotional well-being and physical well-being. So like as we said in other moments when we were sharing, Emotional well-being comes a lot when we are able to really be present for the other and really listen what's going on and give a space without distracting or maybe without overreacting. So we really listen the other without adoctrinating or uh, moralizing or, and at the same time, it's true that that doesn't, doesn't go against having right boundaries when it's I necessary. That, that's the emotional need we've talked about. So you just said, just if I got it, basic needs have got two parts, um, physical needs, if you like, and emotional. So tell me a bit more about the physical needs. Okay, so, but I said a little bit about the emotional ones because for me are even more basic. Like a child can stop eating if he doesn't feel or she doesn't feel like right. and, and taken care. That's why it, it, to feel loved as we are and how we feel in every moment uh, and accepted fully, this is one very basic need. And it's true that then we also have basic needs related to the body, like would be like the, the right temperature when we are sick, uh, being taken care and getting the right attention and the right medicines. Uh, also like, uh, for example, being warm enough. So all about dressing or about our sleep time, about resting, about drinking. So food, drink, heat, health, uh rest all these are basic needs okay. which we uh if we do learn to to create the right uh environment and the right role to be there for it in the right way it can create really a good base of well-being of well-being physically and emotionally and that's the base where true happiness and true growth which is a second that it's not basic needs it's another need it's the need of development of uh of growing and learning and that would, would give a true inner contentment and happiness. But that's another thing. It's not like basic needs. Yeah. So let's stay with the basic needs for a moment. So let's just try and make this also always, if you have an example, I'm just trying to think in my case, also, I want to illustrate two things. One is I have the sense that often the physical and the emotional needs actually kind of go together, that in taking care of the physical needs, um, I don't just mean that they lead to it, but that in the way that we change the nappy of the baby or the way that we clean them in the bath is kind of a physical need of cleanliness, of looking after them. But we can also express the emotional caring. So just pick an ex Could we pick this example? Again, we're talking about younger children who where they got a nappy. So it might be anything from a very small baby up to, you know, a child that's still got their, their nappy. Can you talk just to make it really concrete what this would show up as in terms of, um, you know, take how we change their nappy and maybe then also or how we take do, do the bath um, and or or even, you know, how do we let a child run around with like jam all over its face? So this, that's what would it what does this look like in those actual practices that as a parent you end up doing? Yes. You're completely right. Even though I do classify it, everything melts together very, very in a very one sense. But it's true that the way we touch, the, the way we take care of a body, it's also going to be a, a kind of a speech about very emotional uh, information. If we do it hurrying up without listening, uh, like if if the child was like a little doll that we need to do it fast and we don't really listen the rhythm the needs it, that is also an information for the emotional part it's telling like i don't have time for you it's not important what you feel don't scream like for example what you said about a baby that we want to change the nappy we have very 
incredible examples on how to do that with Amy Pickler. Uh, in Budapest, um, they've learned a lot how to touch the baby, how to explain the baby, what's going to happen with our gestures, with our voice. Can, with... You, can you illustrate that a bit? Like, rather just, do, do you, I really get the idea, but what does that actually look like? I know we could also, we'll be put in the recording some examples later, but what does that look like? If you can illustrate or just what, what how would, what's a really conscious parenting way to change a baby? And maybe what's a not conscious parenting way? Just to talk it through, what would I actually do? I'd take, if I was doing this with a child and you were explaining to me right now and I had, you know, I don't know, a six month old, how would you walk me through doing it? How would you say to, to do that with the child? So the first thing we would put an environment, so we would create a way that the child can be safe and not distracted. So the relationship between the child and me can be direct. It's not like we give something so the child gets distracted and then I do the work. It's not, it's something that we're going to do together. And then I'm going to do in a rhythm that I give a space for the child to collaborate. And when the child collaborates, I'm very attentive. And then I rest because right, I try right. to. So, so Esther, if I can ask you just really concretely, what does that look like? So when you say, so I get the, the description, but does that mean like I, where do I, where do I take Chelsea? So when you say no distractions, I don't put them around all their toys. So I would have a special space for changing them, even as a six month old or a, a two-year-old I don't give them something to play with while I'm changing them so I what would I have a special you know a changing area maybe a towel for an older child or even a smaller child I'd have a special changing top that that's what you're saying I'd create an area with no distractions that's comfortable for them is that right it has to be comfortable for them safe and also comfortable for me so I don't need to run around taking the things and letting the baby alone so I say for example I am maybe in a, in a place that is a little bit high, so my back can be straight. So I'm comfortable and the child is protected. It's in a way that he can uh, be there without falling or things that could be dangerous. And then if he's very small, I always have a, a hand touching the, the baby if it's very small. So he feels like totally safe. And then it's like, maybe I say to him or to her, uh, looking at, at the face and, and, and finding the 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 eyes, maybe the child is, is watching somewhere else. I do not uh, call the child. I do not say, look at me, but I do look at the child and find the way that she connects with me. And then I am soft, I am quiet, I am in peace. I'm not in a hurry. And I really look that beauty, that incredible little body that it's sacred, that it's lovely. And I generate this uh, attention of the way I look, the way I touch. And then I will say what I'm going to do, but very slowly. For example, if it's time for the nappy, say, now we're going to change the nappy. And, and I try to find this connection, this visual connection too. And when I say that, at the same time that I say, it, I already show the nappy. Because like the verbal language is, is always followed with the physical language that makes it a lot easier for the baby and because it's something that we do it every day a few times it really helps and bit by bit he gets to understand better and better that this is the nappy and then now I'm going to have to take your little feet and I'm going to push them up for example and then you realize that as you do it and and you do it slowly bit by bit the little baby even two months old starts to to help and already brings the feet a little bit up and then I say, I, I do a little bit less strength than the last day because he is a, or she's already helping. So this is a, a very subtle thing that you, oh, and thank you. I see you are already helping me. And I smile. And many times the, the baby smiles or does some noise. But you say me something. You can stop a little bit and just be there. It's like really no hurry. And then I'm, I'm going to take off the old nappy. And then it's going to be a little bit of noise. And then you do what you'd say at the same time, very slowly and being aware on when do I have to stop? When do I have to, to keep going? And then if the child gets a little bit uncomfortable, I may stop a little bit what I'm doing and look, oh, something wrong, you're not feeling good. Listen a little bit, see if he can calm down a little bit and then collaborate. So when we do it right, it should be a greatest pleasure for the baby. It has to be a release. It has to be something that the temperature that of the water we use, it's really like sometimes you can put it a little bit in the hand and, and feel 
the reaction to see if the baby feels it too hot or too cold. And then if you see, ah, I see you like it. And then you do it and you see that the babies, even they don't speak, they are very expressive and they do tell you all the time if they are liking it. So if they don't like it, you may go a little bit softer. You may change the temperature. It's really like if you put attention, you can make it really, really something deep with intimacy, with connection, with cooperation, with communication that goes back and forward, not only from me to the baby, but also from the baby to me. And the more you do it, the more they grow with this capacity to really listen and communicate. And it's absolutely amazing, the cooperation. It's true that sometimes if there are emotional needs that are not well digested and there is a little bit of uncomfortable uh, suffering inside, emotional kind of charging that I say many times, then this cooperation, this intimacy, it's very difficult that comes up. And the child wants to be distracted, is restless. And then it's really important that we give space to all this expression of uncomfort and find ways bit by bit that it can become something really beautiful together and not like a fight. And it's true that we need to say over and over that it is a practice that we do not have this experience in our body. Many times we've been treated like, in, like an object. We have not been seen. And the uh, culture we are in sometimes hurries up and do not give so much love and attention. And it is a process for us to learn to give this quality. And we, we need to be compassionate with ourselves, like not try to be perfect at once and say, okay, I'm there. Today I did it five minutes. Then I could not anymore, but I did it five minutes. Oh, I didn't do it, but I'm ready to learn it again. And it's a process that we have like many years to practice. So we don't try to do it the first day perfectly. That's really beautiful. Thank you for uh, sharing that. And I think maybe to share, you know, maybe for parents uh, and for, you know, my own experience was, again, this was a, a kind of helpful um learning in the sense that sometimes one's in a bit of a like okay this it, it's efficiency i think even we might share a, a video to go with this episode where two contrasting versions of how to change a, a child and you know there's there's some degree of of aspect almost like it, it's like a pit stop in a formula one race you know you know the car comes into the the pit stop and it's all about the speed with which they can change the tires on the car and get it to go out again and sometimes as a parent, we're almost like, okay, I want to get them clean, you know, and the difference of really just this presence with the child that actually this is a moment of joy. It, it's not about in order to, yes, we are changing that nappy, but it's actually in a moment of real opportunity for connection and love and taking care of them. Um, and that there's again, that positive, feedback cycle as you do that the child is more happy and more cooperative maybe you can tell me then also a little bit about what does this mean in terms of cleanliness to the child so again this maybe even relates to the discussion in a previous episode of like just let them do whatever they want you know if they want to run around with like jam all over their face or really dirty um that's and they want to do that that's okay or do we make an effort to clean children and, and again we're talking here about changing a nappy, but what about like cleaning a face or suppose they've got, they've got dirty. What, what, what actions do we take? Do we, first of all, do we, do we clean children and, and then how do we do it? What's the way that we would do it if we wanted to clean, let's say it's after breakfast and there's, there's kind of, you know, jam all over the face. How do we do that? In, in for, to start with, for me, it's absolutely natural to clean your child. Like you see it in cats, you see it in horses, you see it in cows, you see it in lions, you see it even in ants, you know, in little insects. It's like the cleaning is, you see it in the monkeys, how long they spend like taking care of each other. You see in a duck, if you are in a river, you see how long a duck is taking care of not only their child, but their own uh, feathers. So they are really white and beautiful. So this is something natural. And it's actually normally, it's something that we love and we enjoy and we have a lot of time to do it. But when this doesn't happen because we have like stress, we have fear, we have lack of attention. Sometimes, for example, uh, 
the, 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 nose, the nose is running and there are snots and we go fast. And this is a very, very sensitive area. And we just do it with our hands fast or, or we do it like from the back. We don't even say we're gonna do it and we just go and take it off. And we don't realize, but sometimes we hurt the child. The little small nose is so sensitive. And then it happens that once the child, you try to clean it, he or she already turns the face away, which it wouldn't happen if the experience is pleasurable. When the experience is pleasurable, I've seen so many little children going to the mother, going to the father, even they cannot yet speak and go like this with the nose, like, help me, you know, because it's annoying to have snots coming down. But then when I am clean, it's, it's a pleasure to be clean, especially if when they clean me, they do it soft and and really taking care that it doesn't hurt by watching my face and how I move and how I express myself. So when this you do that, I've seen it because I've been with many families that since they are babies, they really take care of doing it with love, listening, that it becomes a great expression. The children, they ask for it. And when they do it to themselves, they do it with a lot of love also and taking care. And it is something that it's natural. They want to be clean. They want to be fresh. They want to feel comfortable, which is uh, natural. But when we don't do it or we hurry up, it can happen that the child doesn't want anything to do with that. Uh, it, it kind of rejects it. No, It's like, I'm going to have a bath and I'm going to feel cold or I'm going to feel the, alone or I don't know, many things that I prefer not to have a bath and just like mm, go dirty. And it looks like if we, we give the space and the freedom, it looks like if the child wants to go dirty, but it's not really that. What I've seen is that when the children are taken care with presence, with love, with attention, mm, mm, with cooperation, like with communication, it's not me doing it, but it's something that we do together. They yeah. become very, very kind of solid inside, very safe inside, very full of trust with themselves. And I only want to finish with one little example that when we, do, when we were doing conscious parenting gatherings in the forest, uh, I remember some moments that we could see a child that was not feeling like strong enough in himself. I remember exactly many, many examples, but now the one I'm gonna explain, this child was playing quite concentrated and another child that was full of energy uh, was trying all the time to tell him what to do. And he only wanted to play very concentrated, and but he could not really get the, the strength to say, just leave me alone, <laughs> you know? And it was quite annoying for him. The other one was keep giving orders and, and throwing things to him. The mother was there present. And after some moments, maybe, I don't know, five or 10 minutes, he said to the child, do you want to go? Because I see you're a little bit dirty and to the toilet. And, and the child said, yes, mom. He was already used that those moments were moments where he felt protected and safe and well taken care. They went to the toilet only five minutes and he came back with the face really like bright and clean. But that was not the most important. The most important is that he went straight to the friend and he said, now I want to play my Lego, my Lego, uh, and I want to play alone. But he said it really calm. He just went in the place where he, we had some Lego there. And he just was very clear in what he needed. So it didn't only clean the face, but it gave him like the safety and the strength to kind of express himself after. So this is a good example that it happened many times. That's beautiful. Thank you. And that kind of deep connection between uh, taking care, like physically can be done in this like loving way and this connection with that and then the self-connection of a child to know what they want and i also just want to highlight maybe for myself and anyone listening so just even here like cleaning a child's nose so first of all there's a first point which is we do clean the nose we at least we we, we help the child do that children want that they want to be clean the second is just just to really get this so if there's the child there on the ground we sit standing there or sitting at the table with their runny nose First of all, I think just to emphasize it, we are, we don't kind of go behind them. We don't do it without permission. We come to the child, even a very small child who maybe it's more difficult than to give permission, we would tell them, we would say, I'm going to clean your nose now. 
and even very small children can give an indication of their kind of wanting you know wanting it but in general we would try and wait we would almost always wait until the child is is in, in in cooperation with us. We wouldn't do it. We wouldn't say we're going to clean your nose and then do it without seeing the child is in like nodding or putting their face forward. And if they're not, we want to look at why they're not cooperating. What is the suffering there? What's going on? But then it's like that we do it with love and care and delicacy so that it's an enjoyable and the kind of beautiful experience of kind of caring and taking care. And that then creates this cycle where we're present, we're in front of them. For example, I, I just to check this with you, I think this is something you haven't mentioned, but I remember you coaching me that let's say I've got a two and a half year old and I'm going to clean their nose. I might well get down. I would kneel down or, or bend down to be at their eye level when I do it. I don't do it from up above them. So I'm really present with them and I'm really at their level. Um, I think that's a big point that you actually haven't mentioned as much, which is a lot of the time in doing all of this, you want to be at the level of the child. You want to come down and be at their eye level in all of these interactions, if you can be or whatever. For a baby, it would be not quite the same, but you would be really present with them. So, okay. And then you would clean in and and, and so on. And I certainly noticed that, you know, that, that, that effect that my son really then decided to really want, you know, he'd say, I want my nose clean. Um, you know he'd come over and be you know clean please clean my nose or then even do it start doing it himself when he could he would do that with his little tissue so okay so that's that one maybe in one other just concrete topic to cover is um, bath time and washing so this is something that maybe depending on the child of his very small children it would happen maybe every day or very regularly but again how there's both the kind of just the fact that we would do a, a bath or a shower maybe every day, but how do you do this in a well way? And even, you know, I'm just going to put one example in like my son got a bit like he didn't like water in his eyes. You know, he didn't for some reason at some point he'd got water in his eyes and didn't like it. But how do you deal with that? Probably there are parents out there who've had experience where I know their child doesn't want to have the bath or they don't want to be washed or how do you do it in this really well way? And how do you, how do you, maybe i don't want to say heal but how do you deal when there's things that there isn't you know they don't want to wash their hair you know how do you deal with those kind of things as a conscious parenting approach i'm gonna answer very soon i just gonna want to add with the the example we were speaking about cleaning the running nose yes that times uh I try to go and I see that the, the face is coming backwards or on a side, which means I don't want you to do it. And sometimes I would offer, do you want to do it yourself and give the, the paper to him or, or better the little cloth to him. And then uh, sometimes uh, with my child, because he had a lot of running nose at the end, no matter how sweet you want it to be, it would all, always hurt a little bit. Even we put a little bit of cream, and everything. So what we did is we went to the water, to the running water. And what about here? Maybe here is better for you. And then the water is running quite warm, not too hot, not too, not too cold. And then we would just go there and like make a little story that like, let's put the nuts all down. And he would just like bloom really. And then it was even funny, just like take so many snots and then just put, they go with the running water. And, and then that he liked it. And even now he's an adult and he still goes to the running water to clean his nose. He prefers this than, than all the other methods. So sometimes it's also a matter of being creative. And at the same time, also be firm because sometimes as you, as you said, they don't want to because they have these experiences that it's not something nice, it's not something comfortable, uh, it's even an aggression or there is not enough time and we did it rushing. And that's like uh, humans being, we are very, very sensitive. And when we feel imposed and not taken care, we can close our heart. And then in those moments, uh, I, I can be firm and say, yeah, well, okay, when you finish your puzzle, we're gonna go whether you want it or not I'm going to wait and and maybe it takes half an hour to go up to the to the toilet because he's screaming or or and I I, I realize that that moment that I'm there just listening this screaming this rejection it's also a cleaning for me it's more important than kind of going to the toilet and at the end I remember one time now that we reached the toilet after quite a long walk up very slowly because there were these expressions and I was there like 
yeah, I understand you now would prefer to play and now we go into the toilet. And finally, when he reached the toilet after half an hour, I had to say, okay, after this, we're not gonna do anything else. And then next time we will come back to the toilet to do more things because he started to say, ah, I also have a nail here, a little bit dirty. And then, and this nail in my feet and after half an hour of, because he was enjoying so much. So sometimes there is a no, but then when you, he actually cleans, uh, with the listening and the expression. And then after he connects with the true uh, need of being taken care and, and wanting more and more until you have to say, okay, I'm not going to massage your feet anymore. <laughs> We're going to eat. And then later, maybe I give you another massage. So, and then to go back to your questions, uh, can you remind them just a yeah. short? I I'll remind you. And there, what you're also saying is that we are firm. So let's say in the cleaning of the nose, if they're refusing, we might not force them, but then we're going to stay with them until we kind of get a resolution. We're not going to say, oh, you don't want your nose cleaned or you don't want to uh, wash your face. We are firm. This is very important. We are firm in like doing that cleaning, but we're not going to force it. There's a distinction. We're going to wait with them. We're going to be with them with the upset to get you know, it might even be, re oh, you, your nose hurts. You don't want it to be touched. As you said, I let's go to the water or be creative about finding ways to reestablish the connection and to kind of clean the upset. You know, oh, maybe last time I did it, it hurt your nose. Oh, okay, I see that. And then create that. So I'm, what's what I'm hearing is that there's, again, this opportunity to walk this line of like love, compassion, and firmness and kind of the boundary and the taking care. So my question then was about just um, bath time and other kind of cleaning. You know, we talked about the nose and particularly again, you know, just even what it actually looks like, what would be a great bath time experience? How would you do it? And again, we're talking relatively small children here. Let's say that where you're playing a major role at the beginning, but how would that, what does that look like? I, you know, again, maybe it's like about distractions, you know, for example, do they have lots of toys in the bath? Do they not? Like, what do you do? How do you undress them before they get in the bath? Um, you know, is that done very quickly and efficiently? Or is it done with love and attention and being at their eye level? Just walk me through a kind of bath time. How, you know, if you were describing coaching me and doing it. Great. Yeah, I'm going to do that. And I'm totally, uh, I'm totally like, uh, I totally agree with this, uh, wanting to be giving a lot of a space to his or her own rhythm at the same time be firm. But I just wanna put a note that the, the more aligned the child is with his well-being and her, or her well-being, the more aligned, the less interference of suffering and charged emotions inside, the more it's easy and you don't need to be firm because they just like very happy to, to be with taken care and they want to be. And then we need to be more firm when there are things that need to be cleaned from inside like and then they scream or they, they cry and all that and then it's there when you get a little bit more firm and once that's uh, ready cleaned uh, they just flow and they really love it and they can spend hours so that's that's only a little point well, so can I, can, I, can I actually emphasize that because that's a point that's actually really massive in all of this which is the in a way can I just really like echo that for for myself and for for listeners which is that really when there are when the sense of when you have to, when there's a sense of having to be a firmness or a boundary normally if there's any problem around that with the child it's normally in a sense a sign that there's something that they're dealing with that when you're saying is when the when when things are well there's actually a flow if you say they say i want a cookie you're like it's not cookie now They'll just be like, okay, I'm not going to have a cookie now. I might have one later and they'll have the apple or do something else. Normally when there's conflict or it's even around the nose or any of these things, when there's like, has to be something, it's actually this incredible, it's first of all, it's a sign. It's not normally about that thing. It's about the emotional, there's something there for the child. There's an emotional cleaning. And I want to emphasize it's an opportunity to do that emotional cleaning, you know, in a way, so this aspect of providing the boundaries is not, it's more like that actually just shows up. Like, I don't know how to put it as a metaphor, but in a way there's some maybe rocks or like things hidden under the water. But when you put this kind of boundary, you discover what's under the water, which is that suffering that hasn't got taken care of. 
and you suddenly have this opportunity to take care of the true the, the actual suffering that is there for the child which isn't that they can't have the cookie mm-hmm. it's like that you saying no you can't have the cookie now is touching something mm-hmm. if they then react so that's i think a really really important principle of this which is that the that actually in a way you don't in a truly well set up there in a way there aren't boundaries there's just cooperation around the mutual needs and interests for example for a child to resist being cleaned why on earth would they not want to be taken care of and lovingly cleaned? there's got to be something there in a way even a deeper point about food and i'm just running with this point for a moment when we want a cookie for example something sweet and i noticed this in myself as an adult it's often because there's some suffering i mean of course i just like cookies sometimes but often if i get upset that i can't have a cookie you know i'm like damn who's eating all the cookies in the house uh as as an adult you know oh my partner's eating all the cookies i'm kind of annoyed about it it's often because i wanted the cookie for some to fill something in myself at times when i just want to enjoy the cookie i'm just like oh okay the cookies are gone i'll i'll, I'll have one tomorrow and that's the same with a child of course, they can have great joy in a cookie. But if their reaction to not having a cookie right now is, I want the cookie, give me the cookie, there's almost certainly some suffering that's there. And that's true in all of these points that, you know, even if I say, okay, it's time to stop playing and go to bed, if the child's well, they'll be like, okay, I'm, you know, I'll run and play for a couple more minutes, but there's a kind of cooperation. If, the, if, my, if my son is like, no, I'm not going to bed, you know, there's almost certainly something that's there. And I've really noticed that, you know, I, I remember one time where I couldn't understand why I'd gone away on a trip about a week earlier and I came back and things were kind of okay. And then there was this evening, he just really, you know, I'm like, it's time for bed. And he's like, no. And then like, you know, we have, and what I discovered, and there was a whole upset and a emotional cleaning, which we can talk about. But what came out of that emotional cleaning was he was actually quite upset about me going away but had never hadn't got to say it hadn't got to express that as a two-year-old even though i'd explained i was going away and things that when i went away for three days he was upset about that and it's not like i don't i can't go away but i had not got to kind of be with his upset hear him and have that kind of complete for him and that was a very interesting example where something else completely unrelated actually related back to this upset um so I just want to say that that's a really important point about these these things, which is that we're not we're never um, if there's kind of things coming up around these boundaries or these or these or these or these desires to take care of them and they're not wanting to cooperate. It's almost certainly there's some suffering to be taken care of. Um, like that uh, with boundaries, if the child is feeling peace within. It just flows the same. You find a wall and you decide not to step into the wall or not to uh, crack your your head on the wall. Like this is a limit. You just go around the wall or you look for a door. But when we are uh, full of uh, uh, things that, uh, as you say, that they are inside of us and they need to explode, then with the boundaries is when all these things come. That's why when we put boundaries, we also listen all these things and we don't start giving reasons, as we said the other day, because in a way then we stop expression of the child and we make him listen to our reasons and instead of that we listen and that's always like that with everything like you have two children and they are playing in harmony they listen to each other they just ah you want to go right okay let's go right oh why don't we go left oh we go left but then when a child is charged everything it becomes really difficult the relationships with the sisters or with the friends or with the brothers is like a a big problem and, and they scream and they get angry and I wanted the blue jar and not the pink one and then I, and everything becomes a problem. But in the point that you can go deeper to see how the child is deep inside is when you take care of the basic needs. So you do see it all the time, but basic needs is like if you have like a, a, a path to go right in the heart. When you touch the body, when you clean the body, when you fit the child, when you take care of the worms, or, or when the child is, for example, sick, uh, you prepare the medicine. And if he is not really like filled up with past negative emotions and things that he can st- needs to clean up, he drinks the medicine and he just lies down. And 
like even a very full of energy child when he's or she's angry he's like kind of half sleeping all day and it's like no more than that but when there are emotional things like inside that they are have been loading up then when the child is sick uh, is all the time screaming complaining because it's like i'm sick and i have to also deal with all this so it's just too much for the child that's why it becomes really unbearable he cannot be one minute like uh, just on his own or on her own they just need to keep uh, screaming so it's, uh, this is another point but uh i'm sorry that i'm kind of getting no, no, out no, no, of no, this is a great point so just to say that in the terminology I, I get from a different area you could call these trailheads what i mean is if you're trying to um understand your child's emotional uh state and whether they are in the terminology we've used charged or or, or decharged so are they kind of relatively peaceful in their emotion or they haven't got anything they're dealing with or are they actually got a lot there and as you said one of the points can be it might not be obvious to you as a parent actually it may seem like, oh, they're running around really happy, you know, but actually really underneath that is emotional charge. I mean, I think sometimes we've, um, you know, most parents have seen that like, oh, they all seem so great. And then suddenly there was all this unhappiness, you know, like, oh, they were just running around so cheery. And now why are they screaming at each other or something? That's almost always because really they weren't actually happy. They were charged. And so what you're saying here, I think that's important is in trying to learn how to read your child and read children in general, one of the things is how do they react to the basic needs being taken care of? If a child is, that's one way, you know, if, if your child is not, it, it's being difficult to change the nappy or to clean their face or to look after them or to eat their food or these other things. Or as you said, when they're ill, an ill child wants to be taken care of, but a one that is not emotionally charged will be taking, drink the medicine and just, be kind of cooperative and then rest, take care of themselves. But one that's charged now has a double, you know, they're both in physical pain, but they've also got this kind of emotional uh, suffering or emotion that's there. And that will be unbearable and they'll just be upset all the time. So what you're saying is that one of the real ways we can discover that emotional state is in how they are kind of reacting and behaving and cooperating or not cooperating in relation to basic needs and basic needs being taken care of. How much they take a good con connection with what they need. Sometimes when there is emotional charge, uh, they think they are hungry all day and they want to eat all day. All the time they are even a baby, all the time is asking for breastfeed or a child is all the time asking for food and which is not natural. Normally we are hungry, we eat and then we are content. And when we do, and then we do things, we play, we do things and then after a few hours, we get hungry again, but then all of a sudden you are hungry all the time, for example. Or, or it's time to go to sleep and you see the child is tired, but he or she, can, they cannot fall asleep. And they need a lot of support to fall asleep, for example. And then during the night, they wake up a lot. Or things like that, like in basic needs, it's like a lent, a lent, like a, yes. something that to see things bigger, that helps you a lot to see deeper in. Although you see it in other many ways, how they relate to others, how they relate to themselves, is there concentration or not? Is there the capacity to be alone and the capacity to socialize in a healthy way? Or we need all the time to be distracted, all the time to be taken care, we cannot be alone, or we can never be with others and we're completely alone all the time. So it's a break on the balance. When we are uh, well inside, there is a balance. Sometimes I concentrate, sometimes I'm more active, sometimes I rest, sometimes I eat, sometimes I don't eat. And it's a balance there in everything, in the relationship with myself, with others. And in basic needs, it's easy to take care of a child that it's feeling good and it's enjoyable. And in all, uh, this is another way. When it's tiring to be with a child, it's probably because we are charged and the child are charged too. But if not, we get into this very easy harmony. And I'm totally certain that most of us, we do have experiences when the child is quite in harmony. And another thing, and then it's easy, you know, and then we also have experience when everything is a problem and then it's difficult. And then it's normally because there is this charge inside. And only one thing, when you say sometimes the children look happy, but they actually very charged, that's true. Euphoria, euphoria, like excess of emotion and, and, and playing like very excited. It can happen sometimes, but when it gets very like... Uh, 
long and there is no disbalance between like a, a movement and quietness. Uh, normally is that we are only in the high point and we keep in the high point for a long time and very high point. Then it's when it happens that there is like a problem or something and then it's like a really low point. This is not balanced. This is like, so when I see my child that seems really happy, but it's right kind of euphoric and then it has problems with the food, with the sleep, with, then I can see that's not true well-being and not true happiness. That's euphoria. This is an unbalanced state, which is also good that you share because sometimes we may get a bit confused with that. Exactly. So let's then come back to this question of the bath time. What, what, just walk me through, if you were kind of coaching me, what that would look like, how I would set up the bath space and how I would like, you know, starting from the child being dressed to them having the bath and then getting out. How, how would that go? So the first thing that helps a lot is to have a rhythm where the child more or less knows, like, for example, that like uh, at certain time is when normally we have the bath. That already helps because somehow is ready for that. Or is certain days of the week that we have the bath. And so you, you advise it. So today is the day of the bath. And after um, snack time, we're going to be able to play a bit. And then we're going to already prepare the bath. And when you start preparing the bath, you can go one minute with the child while he's playing, be there, present, wait that the child gives you the attention. And then maybe it's like 10 seconds, maybe it's two seconds, maybe it's one minute. But when the child gives you the attention, now I'm going to prepare the bath because in five minutes, we're going to go to the bath. Even if it's the two years old child, you can already do that. With a baby, you're going to do it more like showing it at the same time with a child, you say it. And then because of the noise you do, you prepare the towel. So you also create a right environment where bath can be safe and where you will have everything there. So you can be present and you don't, you don't need to go running around looking for the towel and the child is like there, like really cold or things like that. You make it easy for you, easy for the child. So it's a pleasure or experience. And then uh, if the child starts complaining, oh, but I'm playing really good and uh, now I don't want to go to the bus, then we do realize, okay, there is some, something to be expressed. So I do listen to that. That's the first bus. The bath from within, the cleaning from within. Because if there is nothing, it's like, okay. Or even it already starts uh, putting the things away. So he knows he has five minutes to think, to make things ready for the bath. It's already a cooperation there. But if let it's... Me, uh, let me just highlight that. So step one is you're preparing the bath or preparing any activity. But I think this is really important. Even very small children, you know, uh, but certainly by, you know, one, two years old, you're telling them. So you're saying to them, we're going to have a bath in five minutes. Maybe you even show them the towel or some other thing. But this point um, about notif notifying them. I also noticed this one other thing we haven't talked about. We will come to is eating. But like the thing that I noticed in your coaching, and I'm just going to mention this like the bath is you'd say last one. It's not like they've got some food and then you suddenly say, that's it you always tell them this is the last one. So if you're taking the strawberries, I don't suddenly say you can't have any more strawberries. You're like, this is the last strawberry. So they kind of know that this will be it. And what you're saying here with the bath is I'm playing, there's a notification of us. Okay, so they've been told, they may be that they've got this five, they've got five minutes and then either this is cooperation or if there's not cooperation, we're kind of, we know we'd go to the kind of, the inner bath, we'd kind of deal with that. But let's say they have cooperated, they come to the bathroom with you and they're there in the space that you set up for the bath. What happens next? So then uh, I create a space where he can or she can, they cannot be distracted with uh, many things. So it can be a relationship between us without like, for example, the TV on or I won't use my mobile or if there is another adult, I will say to the adult, I'm not going to speak now. Uh, I'm not going to have conversation. I'm going to be really taking care of my child. So I kind of protect the environment. And also uh, for the child, I take away things that could distract the child too much. The more clean or the more healthy or the more like in peace the child is, mm, the, the, the intimacy, the cooperation and the communication, it's not that he or she gets so distracted, but you still help. 
And then you try to find that the temperature is right, the temperature of the toilet, the temperature of the, of the water. And you always do this. You, now we're going to take off your clothes. And you see, if he already does it, you don't do it. You always have to have this fine uh, sensitivity to help if it's neat, but also give a space. So even if it's difficult, and so you give a space for, for concentration and for persistence. You don't need to make it easy, but you're there for that. The more, the more autonomous the child is, the less you do, but you're still there. And sometimes it may get distracted with something and you can just wait and breathe. It's not that you need to be all the time, but if he gets totally out of the path, then yes, you need to kind of uh, tell, no, but now we're gonna have a bath. Because for me, it was very important to advise them, as you said before, to advise of everything. Now we're gonna have a bath or to the, this evening we're gonna have a bath, but also if a visit comes, a visit will come. So when we advise the children what's gonna happen, they feel hurt, they feel, oh, they take care of me, they feel respected so they can uh, they can kind of uh, get ready for it and, and do things about it. So with the bath is the same. So now we're gonna take this. And then there are, I remember one case that the child, the, the day of the bath was like a nightmare in that house. Like the mother was saying to me, it's just a nightmare. The day that is the day of the bath, it's a big problem. We get really tense, I get really nervous. The child also is nothing, pleasurable at all and then I, I started to ask her things because for me it's a rule that is very simple for any human being I knew in the planet if something is pleasurable we want it and if something is not pleasurable we don't want it it's so simple so normally a bath can be very pleasurable if the child had such a strong reaction so the first thing we watched is like how as a mother do you relate with bath time yourself what are your experience in the infants how do you feel about it? And if there were, for example, sexual abuse and things like that, we need to talk about it because it's something that it's there. And maybe you live that moment in a way that somehow the child is, is affected by it. And in this case, I remember I said, I think you need to kind of break completely the dynamic because for some months, the dynamic was like that and it was getting rooted into the family. Like bath time is a nightmare time, you know? And we need to change that completely. And I went uh, asking things and it's like, is it the toilet warm enough? And no, it was like a country house and the toilet was quite uh, cold and difficult to warm up. And I said, what if you get like a plastic, like uh, how you would say, like a container, a basal, or I don't know the name, and you put hot, hot water, you know, hot water and warm water, and then you put it on top, I, on front of the fireplace, which is a complete different shift. And she did that. She, she kind of looked at herself. She looked, uh, she tried to create joy in her heart, embracing her own uh, suffering about the bath time. And then she kind of did this cleaning herself. And then from that new place, she said to the child, ah, today we're gonna have a bath, but it's a different expression. And then and we're gonna have a bath in a different way. And then she put the water in on front of the heater or the, the, the fireplace and the child loved it. And then the completely, the, it changed it. So, and then your question is like, do you put a lot of toys? Well, for me, there were two moments in the bus. One moment is like, I am together with you and I kind of clean your, yourself and I give a space for you to clean yourself. And if we put soap, we try to put very little and very healthy soap and very like natural and just taking care that doesn't go to the eyes because if not, they, they are itchy and they really sensitive children about that. So when they don't want things in their eyes is because they're very sensitive. So, and we ask things and we look the reaction. Now I'm gonna put some water in your head. No, but not in the face. Okay, so we go and do it in the back and then bit by bit, he is playing and then the face is all wet already. So they say no, but then bit by bit, they get to be more like able to get this water on the face. But if they need it, I'm there. And if they say, oh, but now I have a lot of water in my eyes. And it's, here you have a towel and then you can help or, or just give the towel depending on the age. And so use that in a loving way to create a moment of uh, really taking care. And then there are other moments that I say, do you wanna play a little bit? And then I may step a little bit uh, apart. And then it's a moment that the child can be really restrict, rest distracted with toys and all, and enjoying about that. And they did so many experiments in the water. It's amazing. And, um, and that's more like a joyful time that I don't need to be 
saying no, let's look at me, be distracted, no, don't be distracted. No, it's their playing time is also okay. And then there's going to be a moment that it's time to finish the bath. Sometimes they don't want to go in the bath, but once they are in the bath, they don't want to get out the bath. That's also very typical. No, it's like a long time to go in the bath and then a long time. So I would also say the same. It's like, I see how fun you, you're having a lot of fun, but in five minutes or, or when I finish the soup, which is in a short time or when, I don't know, you have many ways to express the, the time that it's going to be time to get out of the bath and it's, oh, but I'm happy here. Or if he's okay, he's going to say, okay, well, I can already get out now. It depends on the situation. And then I have a towel. I take care that it's warm enough. Sometimes I put the towel close to the fire. So when it goes on them, it's already warm and we are there and, and we dry very well everything because they're very sensitive. And sometimes we dry very fast, but then in between the legs or in some places, it's a bit... Uh, not so dry so we need to take care to do it well and yeah always like that and with the listening at the end is always the same the listening uh, respecting the rhythm and then we're going to put the pyjama and then also we need to be firm because for me in my case I need a time for myself too so if I spend like three hours on the bus then I'm going to be so tired that if before going to sleep that it is an, another big moment where we have a big possibility to see how the child is. If we have given enough attention and the child has been able to discharge during the day, it's gonna be okay to go to sleep. But there are moments that we are very distracted and then when it's time to go to bed is when we discharge. I don't want to sleep, I don't want to sleep. And if I need to listen that with compassion, with presence, with a hurry, I need to be full of energy. So for me, it was important that the bath ends, for example, I don't know, at half past six. And then if, if we already eat and it can finish at half past seven, and then I have some time for the storytelling and being together. And then if the child needs to express some suffering, I still have energy if it's before eight. But if it's 10 at night, I may not have energy for that. And then I'm not going to be able to give what the child needs. I'm going to get angry. And then we're going to go to sleep in a not in a harmonious way. Then the night is not going to be so so good either or the morning so for me to be firm is also a way to protect my time too it's like okay we need to have a bath to have it with presence with love but I do need to take care that at eight the child is already at, uh, sleeping because from eight on, onwards I know myself and I know that my energy level goes down my presence goes down my patience goes down so I need to protect myself and the child from my monster <laughs> so that that for me was uh, something that helped me to be quite strong in the keeping a rhythm that gives a space for all not only for the child but also for me really great i mean i just want to say i think that's a good moment to pause in this in this episode and in our next one coming up i think we're going to talk more about that compassion for ourselves compassion uh you know and 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 love the way of taking care of ourselves that we can take care of the child and some other topics so just thank you as that's another great uh session that we've covered there thank you to all our listeners and we'll uh be i hope you'll join us for our next episode that's just going to be coming up okay thank you to rufus bye bye